Hello and welcome along to another RT Rugby podcast coming to you a little bit later this Wednesday afternoon. All for good reason, though. We had to wait out on the Ireland squad announcement for the Autumn Nation series that just came out in the last hour or so. Just over two weeks to go until the first of those four games. Uh, first up against New Zealand, then Argentina, Fiji and Australia to follow. Bernard Jackman is with me to, tra- to chat through the bits of news. Bernard, how are you doing? Very good, thanks. Yeah, just obviously some big news with the squad out and the French squad out as well, who I know we're probably not going to talk about it, but just really interested to see Josh Brennan uh, named in the in the French squad and Antoine Frisch as well, um, uh, who obviously is is, is uh, someone that was was playing for Munster. Both of them um, have been named today by by Fabien Galtier, and you would imagine they'll both get capped over November, and that's the end of that. The ship has sailed. Certainly, yeah. 35-man squad confirmed by Andy Farrell today, plus five more development mm-hmm. players as well. I'll run through the main headlines of it. So, at hooker, Dave Heffernan is included alongside Ronan Keller and Rob Herring, which would indicate one or both of those players are on track to be fit, certainly for the first game against New Zealand anyway. Cormac Izuchuku back in, one of two uncapped players in the forwards. Ian Henderson is in. He missed the Tour of South Africa. There's no Jack Conan. Uh, we're assuming that it's, it's the hamstring injury he picked up against Munster, uh, just given the way he started the season. Peter O'Mahony is still injured, but he's included in the squad. He's not going to travel to Portugal next week. Uh, he's going to do his rehab at Munster. Caelan Doris, obviously, then has been named as captain. In the back line, no major surprises at all, really. Sam Prendergast is the only uncapped back in there. He's alongside Jack Crowley and Kieran Frawley among the out halves. We'll obviously certainly get to see him debut, I would say, in one of those four games. Mac Hansen and Hugo Keenan back in there as well, having missed out on the tour of South Africa. And as usual, as I said, some additional development training panellists, whatever way you want to call them. Leinster, Jack Boyle, Thomas Clarkson and Gus McCarthy. And then Munster's Alex Candela, who captained the Emerging Ireland Tour in South Africa. And Connacht Shane Bolton is the fifth one in there. We'll start with the captaincy appointment, Bernard, Caelan Doris. It felt inevitable at some stage, um, whether it was now or this year. But I suppose Peter O'Mahony's injury kind of made the decision for Andy Farrell, really. Yeah, and look, it was certainly being strongly hinted at last year that that Farrell saw Caelan Doris as having um, serious leadership potential. I think it even surprised kind of some of the players in the squad who didn't see that in him. Um, but Farrell identified that early. Um, and the fact that Leinster have have obviously given him the captaincy um, start of season in, 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 uh, on his own rather than a, a, a co-captain situation and, and just he, he's obviously done very well for him his form as a, on the field has been incredible and um, like obviously age profile wise um, I think Pete he probably was a stop gap after Johnny you know just to get us through that Six Nations and obviously we won it and, and um, it's still very much part of the Irish team but it's not a young team the, the training the training group obviously has some, some youth in it you've got a couple of fellas who haven't got their cap like some is it Juku and and Prendergast in in the senior squad as such? But it's a it's a very experienced squad. Um, but yes, a captain C Doris is someone that could be there for um, a long time if things if things go well. And it's going to be really interesting to see him step up to that level of you know playing the, being captain against the, the likes of the All Blacks in Australia and Argentina in particular um, this November. So probably not a surprise really, but it's obviously just confirmation of what. Certainly, we've been hearing and 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 what uh, a reward for a good start to season with Leinster as captain. Yeah, it certainly has, and like he's been fairly honest as well, Doris, about how he's still growing into the role as captain. He kind of he obviously would have captain teams when he was younger, but it was really only at the start of twenty twenty four when he moved into that role with Leinster in in bits and pieces, and mm. then filled in on occasion during the the Six Nations when Peter O'Mahony might have been off the pitch, and then obviously started as captain in the second test against South Africa. And I, like we saw during that first test in in Loftus where he ran into issues with Luke Pierce around the communication, he's been fairly open that that's something he's really working on trying to figure out how to to get on the right side of referees. It's all a process really of of stepping up to captaincy. And I don't know, I, I think in the early stages of this season, we're probably seeing him balance it a little bit better now that he's a little bit more used to it? Yeah, I think he has. And you know what? It's, it's Some of it's just relationships and, mm. and for the referees to, to trust them and, and understand what they're like under pressure and how they speak and how often they're going to question things and just that respecting 
Um, I got, I'm actually doing something. I'm interviewing Andy Farrell tonight. Uh, uh, and I can't wait to ask him about Caelan because, uh, as I said, I know for a fact he spotted this before anyone else that I know of in Irish rugby has, has identified him as being somebody that could potentially captain his country. Um, and uh, I'm going to try and dig a little bit deeper in that or what, what he sees in him um, that gave, that had that confidence. Because sometimes with a, with a player that's playing so well, like he was, you, the temptation is not to actually burden him with something else. And now he's got a big job on his plate because effectively, you know, what he's doing, because a lot of people are saying he could be the Lions captain, right? Uh, but like, like even Brian Driscoll, you know, it was a lot on him. It was demanding a lot of him to captain Leinster and Ireland. Um, you know, you have to be on every single week of the year. Whereas, um, you know, Leo Cullen ended up being captain and we got the best of both worlds because we got Brian... Uh, being fresher, um, and then he was you know, able to captain Ireland brilliantly. So that's going to be that's a huge amount for him. I know the game time is managed um, very well, etc. But I think he's in the right environment. You know, he obviously has in his coaching staff now. He has Farrell, obviously one of the, the greatest leaders of all time, captain Great Britain at twenty one. Um, you have Paulie. I don't know how many times he captain Ireland, 40, 50 times. Or, uh, captain Munster, hundreds of times. Now you have Johnny Sexton part time in there, obviously. The previous captain, you've Peter Mahoney captain um, in the squad. Like it's not you've Ty Byrne captain in Munster. Like it's a you've Ty Furlong, uh, you've Gary Ringrose. Like it's just a it's such an experienced squad. Um, and like we, to be fair, the criticism or the question marks could be around, you know, where's the development, where's the experimentation, um, and a lot of other teams were probably a little bit more radical last year. Um, in the Six Nations or, or on the summer tours around kind of that looking forward to, to Australia in 2027. We've been we've been very much one game at a time um, and just bringing true players kind of in a little bit more uh, evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And, and that's that's fascinating as well. Obviously, we've got a Six Nations uh, to profi. We have a, a test win in, in South Africa. So the results and performances are, are there. Um, and it's such a massive November. I mean, um, I think there's a lot to be said for just keep winning um, and and getting those big scalps. Um, and the likes of the Emerging Ireland Tour, um, or an, it was an opportunity to have a look at some of the some of the players underneath. But his whole how he's going to build this squad towards Australia um, is also going to be fascinating to watch. And whether he sees these those little like those five players named as training squad members. Uh, which you know, like the Sam and Cormac were last year, is that is that like an academy? Is that part of of mm-hmm. their development? And and just as important as getting a cap, you know, I think some people think, oh, give them a cap. Um, but in uh, under Farrell, it tends to be that when they get a cap, they're ready to get a cap and ready to perform. And I think um, we should show a lot of trust in in the, in 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 that man. A couple of um kind of wider background questions that a couple of people have put in uh, from X. So. This one is from at BH Hooker, ball handling hooker on X. Is is O'Mahony's spot in the starting 15 under threat, even with no Conan? What happens in the event of an injury to Josh van der Fleer? So, I, what I'm t- like, if we're assuming that O'Mahony probably isn't going to be available for the mm. New Zealand game, um, what way yeah. you should up a back row if something happens to Josh van der Fleer, for example? If I had to drop Josh van der Fleer, I'd go Timoney. Um, straight into I, seven or yeah, I would. No, no I'd, I'd I'd leave Zaris at eight. I I, I, I look at he can play seven. Yeah, but um, and he, he's 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 a very capable seven. But I just think he's so good at eight. I, I think he's so good at eight. So I wouldn't move him now. Um, I I, I wonder as like would they would Conan have been injured? You know, if does Baird come into discussions at six? Not. Based on what he's done, because he's obviously hasn't played, um, he's been injured as well. But like just that athleticism that seems to be everyone is chasing now and has having such a big influence on games. Um, and to be fair to Pete, every time there's been question marks about him, he's he's found a way to step up uh, and adapt and evolve and still have big moments. So I'm not writing him off. And, and um, I just I think it's hard on him. Obviously, you know, he got an injury. Uh, against the Ospreys and he won't have played um, and whereas Baird is in a similar situation um, 
I just think we know what he can do. You know, we, we know what he can do um, in terms of big moments as well. Obviously, more more often than not, with the ball rather than um, Pete is, is very good without it. Um, so yeah, it's it, lo- it looks a bit, it looks a little bit light there. Uh, the back row um, with Conan being out um, and with Pete obviously having a having an injury at the moment. And and look at the, and obviously hooker wise, you know, you've two hookers who. Who current haven't played um, uh, over the last few weeks, so you're taking, you know, you're taking into account them being back fit. Um, but obviously, look at the, the the alignment and the collaboration between the Irish medical team and the and the provincial squads is is second to none. So, um, and it's also interesting as well. Like, so what well, Peter Manny's in the squad, but he's not going to Portugal. He's going to do his rehab in Munster. Mm-hmm. And you know, seeing what Wales are doing, so Palatau, Liam Williams, um, and uh, well, Liam Williams, and one more, um, I can't think for a second, are injured, won't play in November. Oh, Josh Adams, but they Gatlin's bringing them into Wales to do their right. the rehab. You know, it's just different how different countries, and I think it, 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 it's a sign of confidence in the in the Munster medical team and prep that you know, uh, Pete is allowed to stay in Munster for the week rather than be in Portugal. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating how other head coaches um, see different strengths and weaknesses in their system and, and how they adapt to that. Um, something else. We'll move on to out half then. So, Kieran Frawley is named in the squad. That's obviously a good sign after his uh, ankle injury at the weekend. Um, the, the the bigger news, I suppose, around the out half situation is, and you briefly mentioned it there earlier on, that it looks like Johnny Sexton is is coming into into the coaching ticket in some capacity next month it doesn't look like it's going to be a, a full-time role uh the irish times were reporting this morning that it's um i suppose like a part-time job working with the out halves around the yeah. kicking game and stuff like that because it's i suppose you do have two still relatively inexperienced well three three inexperienced yeah. out halves in that group sam prendergast alongside crowley and kieran frawley um fascinating to see that move because he he, he is kind of presented himself as someone who wouldn't have been particularly interested in coaching but I suppose you know when a player with that level of experience and and quality in the game is in any way available you've to you've to ask the question at least don't you yeah look at I think look at Farrell um uh has uh, has seen the the potential in, in Johnny to be a coach obviously Johnny's gone down a, a different route um and he's uh, he's fully committed to his job but there's an opportunity here, like Johnny and Raj and, and Johnny. I even listened to something with Johnny. I interviewed Johnny Wilkinson last week, and and you know Dan Bigger. They had to learn the hard way. You know, they, they often didn't have a mentor um, whose whose sole job was to was to help them um, and guide them through what's an incredibly difficult career. You know, um, uh, and, and Johnny obviously had. Some brilliant coach. Like I know he speaks. Like my, my time with him was was David Knox, and 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 he was a maverick, but he was a brilliant attacking mind. And and um, he had Felipe, uh, obviously a little bit la- later on in his career. Um, uh, but he had he had good coaches who who helped him um, get better. But it, I think it's only really the like the likes of a Knox or a Felipe or a Ron Agar or Johnny Sexton who really can understand what a young ten is going through and how hard it is to to make the right decisions whether that's kicking game or that's running game or that's goal kicking um whether that's how to speak to the group how to to manage you know breaks in play in terms of you know who you need to speak to so there's so much there um he's still I'd, I'd say he's probably watched more rugby now than he did when he played because I think when he played he was very focused on the opponent um and uh, he's he's had a chance to 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 look at games from a different angle. Um, and just going in in November, it's obviously in November. It's in it's in Ireland, you know. So the ability to to be part time, um, working with those with those young young tens, um, is is obviously something that that is interesting to him. He sees he can add value, and if Johnny couldn't add value, he he wouldn't do it. I mean, that's the that that that's hundred percent. And the three of them know them. Like I know Sam. Sam uh, taught a lot of them, and Jack Crowley thinks a lot of them. For Crowley thinks a lot of them, um, and I think it's inspired by Humphreys and by Farrell because sometimes coaches are like, or are heads of performance, they 
they they're afraid of the of the negative aspect or potential of only having someone part time, you know, and they and they shut it off because oh, it's it's a professional environment, everyone needs to be full time. Well, if you have someone who 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 wants to add value and it can work around his other commitments, uh, and you've got, you know, look if 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 these, if these lads all had seventy or eighty caps, it wouldn't be as important, but effectively we have a chance here where we've got three, I think, incredibly talented, uh, bright prospects. Um, Jack obviously being the most further along, but still far from a, you know, a, a seasoned campaigner um, that could benefit from his expertise. And yeah, Farrell and, and Humphreys have made it happen. And I also think Farrell deserves a lot of credit for, for effectively, I suppose, bringing through Irish coaches, you know, whether this becomes a, a, a a long-term thing or not, but like you know, Simon Eastery, Paul O'Connell, John Fogarty um, are all getting invaluable experience under under Farrell's watch, and you know, um, you replaced Andy uh, uh, Mike Cat with Andrew Goodman, who obviously is New Zealander, kept New Zealand system, but was in was in the Irish setup, and um, you know, when the players talk about those Irish coaches, uh, they talk about them in in, in incredibly um, High high terms and and uh, but they're getting that mentorship and that 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 environment and that opportunity to coach at the highest level under under Farrell. When sometimes we see, you know, coaches just go abroad. Um, as a, as a matter of fact, I think Farrell has managed to um keep the whole thing fresh, but by bringing people from within the system. So uh, I I think it's a huge positive. I'm fascinated to just to see how those those lads develop under him, and it's great for Johnny to be able to do it you know, on a part-time basis as well and, and um, get a chance to give something back um, but still continue his career with, with Arda. But, and even, you know, we always forget as well, like, you know, it, it's been, it's been spoken of a lot, the fact that Johnny Sexton only really made his breakthrough in terms of Ireland when he was in that 24, 25 year old bracket. Like, Jack Crowley is, is where he is now. He's got, whatever, he's probably up around 15 caps or so. He's, He's got more experience at this at this stage of his career than Johnny Sexton did at his. Kieran Frawley Grant is a little bit older; he's twenty six now, but he has limited out half experience. And then you look at someone like Sam Prendergast, who's miles ahead of that curve already in in his career. Like there's, you kind of said if if Johnny Sexton was available, why wouldn't he go for? It? I mean, it's it's a no brainer, really. Yeah, I don't like. I look at the other countries. There's probably not another country who needs who need him as badly. You know, realistically, if 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 the ten the key position for, for Irish rugby, which it is for, for every country. But we, we genuinely have three very talented um, prospects. Uh, very different, all very different. I think the most exciting thing is they've all shown that they have big match temperament. Um, but they're all still going to, they're all going to have struggles. They're all going to have bad days. Um, they're all going to have doubts. And I think, so that's really important, that guidance around being a playmaker, being a leader, um, dealing with setbacks, you know, seeing the game live rather than having all the answers on a Monday morning, and um, that's the key. That's the difference. That the great tens um, are able to make decisions on the hoof through good scouting, good decision making, um, but also being able to communicate to others so they can get on the same page quickly. I think it's very easy on a Monday morning to to be able to say you should have done that. That space was there. Should have done this, etc. But it's who can do it live. Um, and he's been through that. Uh, he's been the fulcrum of, of Leinster in Ireland for for the last 10, 12 years. And um, that's important. Uh, and also, I, I suppose, just also from a kicking point of view, I, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to have time to do actual kick coaching. But like Ireland don't have a kicking coach since Richie Murphy left, you know, like, um, you know, uh, Leinster, Emmett Farrell does a bit of kicking with the, with the, with them. Um, I know someone in each province will be doing some kicking, but like in terms of that real expertise, you know, um, that Johnny obviously invested in his career with Dave and Allred. That's, and that's that, that is an area that all three of them still yeah, 100%. Are increases in. 100%. And like, again, like, I know that like David Allred, obviously he's, he's jumped across the golf and back, but it's, it's his, it's his, his expertise around practice and, you know, how to have, quality practice that will lead you to being able to kick under pressure. Like, you know, Johnny has whatever, 10 or 12 years of experience of of, of even working with him, um, if that's an area that he, he wants to get into, whatever. So I think, like, the fact is, you know, probably Ireland, 
possibly Ireland need a kicking coach. Um, I know um, uh, out of the 10 from um, the north, from from Ulster, who was playing for Exeter for years, Gareth. Um, yeah, so he's he's back doing some work for the RFU. Um, uh, but again, like there wasn't someone with Ireland or with the 10s, uh, as far as I know, who were exclusively working with them. And again, I'm not sure if that's something that Johnny is going to do, but if it is... Um, it could be a massive help because the goal kicking part, the pressure, uh, line kicking, like there's so much to it. restarts now, and, and um, yeah, there's there's going to be there's a lot of pressure on these tens uh, to deliver quickly, and any any way we can help them is is definitely worth pursuing. Um, what else will we talk about? Uh, I've got a list of various positions and stuff. Uh, I have one. I have something you weren't going to talk about that I'd like go to talk for it, about. Go so for it. yeah, so basically. Had a coffee this morning uh, with Felix Jones, who is as impressive a coach as I've ever met. Uh, the man is a the man is a, not just a good guy, but he's an encyclopedia of knowledge. But he obviously um, is working for England and, and and all that stuff. But he, we were chatting about one of the law trials, which I think is going to be really interesting in November. Um, the coaches were the Six Nations coaches. Were um were briefed on this last week by by the referee. So effectively, one of the trials, which is is coming in, everyone's been talking about a twenty minute red card or red card. But actually, what I think is more interesting um is what's an effort to to create more contests in the air um, oh, from I World saw, Rugby. Saw this mentioned yeah. this morning, yeah. Okay, so so basically, the referees have been told the glove or the kick es- escort, which you know Eddie Jones, but so when he but 2017 2018, uh, England were the masters of it. But now everyone's good at it. Right? Now everyone is good at it. So effectively, now when you box kick, you've actually kind of nearly given up your chance of getting the ball back uh, because that protection is 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 so good at the moment that effectively the team that the ball has been kicked on to generally catch it. They've got lots of bodies around the ball. They resource the rope, but it's crap ball to counterattack off because you've put so many players back on the kick escort that you've got too many bodies around and the defense have, have moved forward and you've had to move back. So it's often now it's kind of creates negative play. So the opposition then will either kick it back directly through a box kick or play a phase, then kick it back. And it's not pleasing on the eye. Um, and they have done everything in their power to clean up the rook. So they're obviously putting pressure on nines. Nines can't dummy. Pressure on to use it quicker, but they're still the caterpillar, and it's a it's a it's an eyesore. People don't enjoy it. So um, now they're going to put massive focus on 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 that on that uh, block, that block or glove escort uh, or cradle, and effectively referees are going to look at. And you don't have to you don't have to change lane anymore. It's 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 are you genuinely making the attempt to get back behind where the catch happens? So. It, we have we'll see how it's going to be refereed. It's going to be it's it's been tried this weekend against Japan, New Zealand. Neither teams are slaves to, to the trap or to the box kick, but it's not just for box kicks. It's for kickoffs. It's for contestables in general, and anybody who's loitering in the area um, will be penalised. Uh, and if they enforce this, it's going to create a lot more area contest, and it will change the profile of player who coaches will want to pick. So a Rob Carney will become, you know really important because obviously if he can dominate the sky from behind um, a Freddie Short uh, will become more important wingers who, who are good at chasing kicks so there's two different types of catches obviously there's the one where you're coming onto it and the one where you're chasing your own kick um, and the idea will be that if any players trapped in the same part of the field if you get the ball back um, as a, as, a, as a team of kickers, you'll be in better position to go play. And that transition, that that chaotic type possession is exciting to watch. And likewise, potentially, if you catch it yourself, the ball's kicked onto you and catch it, you have a better chance of actually running it back or kicking the space, etc. cetera. So um, that's something I'm fascinated. Uh, it's been rammed in late. Like this is like, when normally this has been trialed you know, in, in different competitions. This is coming in now for the November internationals, like England play New Zealand next week. Sorry, England plays, yeah, New Zealand next week, yeah, Twickenham. So, like, that's a big game for, for effectively to have one match as your sample size. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm sure Andy Farrell and, and Ireland will be looking at it. Um, but that's for me, if, if they allow contests in the air, I think there's going to be loads of 
collisions in the air, right? Yeah. Um, and how we referee that, uh, and like because you get your timing slightly wrong there, Neil. I actually think it's more dangerous than a head high contact than a tackle because when I if I'm carrying the ball, I'm braced for contact. Yeah. If I get hit in the head, obviously it's not good. You're but I'm braced for, yeah, you know, I'm I'm falling. My my feet are on the ground. I'm I'm coming from six feet down. Uh, up and likewise, if I uh, but like if I'm jumping in the air and you've got two athletic players who collide and there's, there's maybe a both catch at the same time, one rips more than the other and he, and they go head over heels. That's going to be um, that's going to be interesting. But the, the the intended outcome is is that effectively it frees up the game that if a team box kicks, we can actually start to attack off it. You know, both sides. But again. Um, how it plays out and if referees are able to manage it because referees already have a huge task so to watch five guys running back and um, as I said it's not just changing lane anymore they have to be in a genuine position to catch the ball and that's pr- that's that's pretty hard um, so yeah that's going to be that's the thing I'm looking forward to in November is seeing seeing if that has an effect the desired effect on, on the game um, and how teams adapt to it yeah so like the example you're painting here will say is box kick goes up and you might have, you know, it's 10 yards down the pitch and you have mm. your your kind of three or four forwards who they're not deliberately running in front of the, the chaser, but they're just standing there essentially doing nothing, just taking up space. So in, yeah. in this scenario, the referees are, are clamping down on those players that they're saying, now you actually have to make an active effort to get out of the channel, is it? Yeah, so what? No, generally, what they don't stand. If they actually stood, it'd be okay because then the the, the kick chaser will be able to get past them. Yeah. All right, and have a have a collision, not collision, have a genuine uh, contest for the ball in the air. What they do is they they run back as a group. There's actually about six or seven of them, or sometimes eight, and they protect this glove. So yeah. basically, it, it's it's nearly impossible to get past them, and that, then the, the the defending player coming onto the ball has a has an easier catch. Um, so I think what they're saying is it, it doesn't even have to be contact if so you can have obstruction without contact which is a rugby league kind of interpretation um, whereas we would have always said for obstruction there has to be some kind of, of of contact they're actually saying if they feel that someone's running line is intended to obstruct then they can be penalised um, so how coaches adapt to that do they say right we just sprint back and get Outside of the catcher, and to be able to come back in through the gate, but that if that's if that's how it's adapted to, it will create you know a, a cleaner contest in the air, and then obviously you're there to pick up the crumbs. Uh, whereas at the moment they're kind of all happy to stay ball side, if you get me, yeah. and allow that jumper to jump uncontested. Um, in actual fact, they're between the the the, the defender and the catcher. Uh, their own players are so. Um, but like it, it, it'll come for everything. It, it for restarts. I mean, effectively, if you're allowed go contest that ball in the air, and you have a pod in the air, um, as long as you're, you're athletic enough, you can effectively jump up and challenge the pod. You know what I mean? And and then you'll see a collision in the air, like the Andrew Osborne try mm. on the weekend. It's it, it's it's a it's kind of what they want to create. You know what I mean? It's not there wasn't a pod, but they want those chasers to be able to go and attack the ball which we've kind of seen gone out of the game because of fear of, like, when's the last time you've seen a red card or a yellow card for a really uh, dangerous area collision? And, you know, it has, it was three or four years ago, it was a big part of the game. Um, but it's gone over now because of how how smart teams are under, ex, under escort. But they're trying to get that out of the base. I'm not saying they're trying to get collisions in the air, but they're trying to get contests in the air again and, and the fractured possession that that creates. Yeah, that'll be a really interesting one to see. Um, couple of last points on the the Ireland squad specifically. There are a couple of couple of uh, tweets we've had come in. Um, a couple of people mentioning, uh, David McCann as a player, kind of, essentially a few different tweets along the lines of how have we not seen him in an Ireland squad at this stage? Um, it's obviously such a ridiculously competitive area. You can throw Max Deegan into there as well, considering yeah. the way he's he started the season. Um, but on on David McCann, are you surprised we didn't see him either in an emerging Ireland squad a few weeks ago, or or in this? Look, I think I'd be absolutely shocked if he isn't very much in our mind. Mm. I think the reason he didn't go with emerging Ireland is because Ulster needed him, and he was going to play in that, and they were able to watch that. I think 
forget about the five. So the the five squad players. I mean, you've got Jack Boyle there, um, who has obviously hasn't played a lot. Played last weekend against Connacht and was, and was but, meant to be on the emerging Ireland squad. Yeah, he's, yeah. So, but he's a guy like there's a, there's a serious gap at loose head. So, like, so that in that position, I think get him in there. Bruce McCarthy's obviously there because of his potential, but also if anything happens, one of the other hookers, you have a hooker already in the squad. Um, but in general, I, I think for like some McCann, who's in an area that's already very competitive, um, the first block of URC games has pushed his case forward. But the next the next step for him now is 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 Champions Cup. Um and to perform at that level. Um and then and then and then obviously hopefully to go into that senior squad as a as a as a as actually a test contender rather than in that training group if you get me so I think that scene that that training panel gives them an opportunity to have a look at people um and to have a few wild cards. So like Jack Boyle is a wild card in terms of what he's done this year, but we know how talented he is. Um uh, but the reason the main reason he's in there is because there's a there's a big issue with succession planning in at Lucet. So mm-hmm. it makes sense to have him in there. Whereas I think with McCann he's in an area that's highly contested um, with lots of experience very very good campaigners and he just needs more time probably the next step now is Champions Cup level dominate at that or, or be very comfortable at that and then he'll get his chance does that uh, make sense? Yeah you mentioned obviously that one of the reasons McCann probably didn't go on the emerging tour was because he was needed by Ulster because Ulster were also losing Cormac Isachuku yeah. and Harry Sheridan as well would just there's another question in and it's the last question we'll do in Ireland is that say is that the same logic as to why, for example, Thomas Clarkson is here ahead of Scott Wilson, who was on the emerging tour? This is a question coming in from from Jack Newton. Yeah, it, I think Scott. That they just what they want to be able to see more players over a over a period of time. Yeah, I think so. I think Clarkson Clarkson's an interesting one. Like it's 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 all about potential um, and. It's not probably what he's done so far, but he's, he, in my opinion, he's he's further along than, than Wilson. I think Wilson's Wilson's someone that we're going to have to keep a a real close eye on. Um, he's certainly done done well. Um, but I think the the, the advantage Clarkson has is that if if anything happens to Rabba or 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 Furlong, he's going to be in there amongst an Irish pack. You know, that's the uh, and unfortunately, I think that does have a. It does have an effect. I think it, it does have an effect, and there's a trust there. Obviously, he's been, um, he's someone that Farrell has had in and look at before. I think as a, as a kind of a junior member, and he's just probably a little bit further along than, than Wilson. But Wilson's Wilson's making good progress, to be fair, and I think he's certainly someone that we would see a lot of over over the next couple of years. Yeah, I go along with that as well. Right, that's uh, that's been a lengthy Irish squad chat. Um, on top of that, we do still have to go through some of the, the United Rugby Championship talking points. We're hitting the midway stage of the UR, or the, the one-third stage of the URC regular season this weekend. All four provinces in action on Saturday. Um, We'll probably go through, we'll pick out the main points mm. for each of the, the four provinces because we don't have time to kind of get into the weeds of it all. Um, Sharks against Munsters, 3 p.m. on Saturday. Leinster against the Lions at 5.15. That's our live game on RT2 and RT Player. Then at 7.35, you have Ulster away to Cardiff, Connacht at home to the Dragons. We'll start with Munster because that's where the biggest talking points of the week have come, as they often tend to. 11th in the table after last week's defeat to the Stormers and a particularly painful one, uh, you know, a two-point game heading into the last five, six minutes and ultimately coming away with nothing. Um, the line-out, obviously, is the the talking point coming out, coming out of that weekend and coming out of the last few weekends, to be honest, as well. Eight out of 14 against the Stormers on Saturday. That's after 11 out of 16 the week before against Leinster. 79% ball retention on their own throw. Second last in the URC uh, with only Zebra behind them. One line-out steal as well. So this is, they're not even, you know, this is on defensive and attacking line-outs mm. that it's just not really clicking at the moment. What is, if you can explain it in a short amount of time, what is going wrong and how do you fix it? Uh, to be honest, it's... It... Everything is going wrong, and that's uh, no. But I, I don't mean to, to to be throwing um, throwing them under the bus. But like, it's just it looks like it's just not fluid. It's just not sharp, yeah. and hence you're getting a multitude of different mistakes. So, a couple of bad calls, um, some some bad lifts, some some 
poor um, execution of a call, you know, uh, being late on a, on a lift, being late with a movement, um, a couple of bad throws, good defence because the defence smelled, smelled blood. Like, I don't, I don't rate this Stormers defensive line out, but Mon- they, they had Munster Rapid, you know, um, and uh, that's, that's, that's something that, look at, I think being away for the week, actually, um, with no travel, well, sorry, an easier travel schedule, obviously getting across South Africa rather than going down there, means they can have more time on their feet. I think they only had two sessions last week, two proper sessions where you can have walkthroughs, you can have, um, you know, you can have theory sessions, you can, uh, you can actually get some drill, you can throw a lot more um, this week. So if they're going to fix it, I think this this is a this is the week to start seeing some improvement in it. But the problem is when when confidence goes, it puts more pressure on on everybody, uh, particularly the caller try and I suppose uh, find space and, and, and try and get get quality ball like they're not going to be able to turn it around unless they get that line of fix so Scrum Scrum didn't look I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the extra stats are but Scrum was way weaker than it, it uh, probably showed in the stats because they were under massive pressure and that affected their launch then after that uh, because you know they were getting scrappy ball away so it's set piece is a, is a big concern for them and that's probably to be honest that's you know Graham was very honest and said, "Look, our ball retention, our accuracy." But if you're living on scraps, to to, to try the 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 fifty fifty pass or, or 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 take a risk because you're not you you need something to happen quickly. And I think that's something that's drifted into their game is that they're so paranoid or panicky about possession because the set piece hasn't been functioning. That they're looser than they normally are. Like I don't, I don't even monster. Like you watch the Lions or you watch the Stormers, they're they're both kind of high risk. And if they lose the ball, it's not a big deal. They they know they can score off mm. off uh, uh, off a turnover or, or an intercept or a breakaway. They don't need a huge amount to, of possession to score. Whereas I think Munster do. They do. You know they're very methodical. They're very well coached. Um, they have to break teams down through their through their shapes and through their detail and. When you're living off scraps, then that becomes even harder. And then they're starting to panic a little bit and go for the go for the for the riskier pass. Um, and the problem is the, the advantage they have is that they've been in the situation for the last three years. The frustration would be is that they're back in the situation again and having to dig and 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 show lots of character and 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 find a way when like to be honest, uh like their their opening schedule wasn't too bad because like including this game, I mean, okay, the Sharks in the last week, you know, last uh, week looked much better, but realistically, Stormers and Sharks uh, are both at sea level, yeah. and they both had their issues. So, you know, Munster to come home with nothing this weekend, um, to be down the league table, and also have a couple, have uh, had a, a favourable enough draw bar that game away in Crow Park. Um, and then, uh, like you kind of said it there. And Graham Rountree used the phrase panicky, kind of what happens yeah, when yeah. when when a few throws are going off or when there's a few communication issues. Once there are a few little issues in the line out, people start to get a little bit more tense. And obviously then as well, the opposition start to smell blood and they're probably more inclined to contest. They're probably more inclined mm. to go a little bit more aggressive. Um, the the other issue that's affected them now, I think in general, the the injury the injury issues probably aren't as bad anymore. Some of them have cleared up. You know, there's players back at home in Limerick who are back training fully as well. But at Loosehead, that's where the issue is now. Because you, you now have four, you have the four senior Looseheads who are out injured. You have two fit Looseheads, both of whom are in the academy, Karen Ryan and, and George Haddon. Haddon hasn't even made his Munster debut yet. Um, and then you have John Ryan who can cover uh, at a pinch if, if necessary. Roundtree kind of said... They're urgently looking at a at a short term solution. Do you think they're going to have the scope to actually bring in some uh, a non Irish qualified player? I hope so. I hope so. Now the only problem is obviously there's a there's a break after after this weekend. So yeah. you know I I'm sure the RFU Humphreys will want to know how bad those injuries are. You know are they going to be back for 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 the next for the next round in November? Um, I'd like to see them being given support. Yeah, I, I think like it's, it's horrendous the uh, the injuries that that uh, Rantry has, and also to be fair, like if you move John Ryan across to cover Loosehead, like Roman Salano is injured as well. Who's, you're you know, de- you're who's down a, a tight end. You know, yeah, you're you're tight. You're tight enough on that side as well. Um, so 
Yeah, absolutely. And look, there is players available. Um, uh, that's the only like the market for players is horrendous. So there's there's players out there who are training with teams as free agents. Obviously, there's there's not rock stars available, but you could get lucky. You just, they just need a body, and it's a lot of pressure on George Haddon if he ends up having to, um, you know, to 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 overplay at, at this stage of his of, of his development. And look, the Sharks. Like I watched the Sharks um, at the weekend, and it's the Sharks that we we thought we were going to see for round one. Now I know they they didn't have their box, but like they had won two trophies in the last seven months: the Challenge Cup and the um, and the Curry Cup. But yet they were so patchy. But their performance against Glasgow and just seeing that team walk out the tunnel, like um, it's 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 like it's a team that should be tenders. I mean, yeah. you know, um, uh, Ox, because Ox, of Ox and Shea, Bongi on Banana, yeah. Vincent Cobb. Yeah. Sia Khaleesi, even it's a bit. Trevor yeah. Anyakanya on the bench, Jason Jenkins on the bench. I mean, it's yeah. no, it's 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 the it, it's the Harlem Globetrotters, but um, and the and the, the owners have been very patient. Obviously, they've had two trophies, but their URC form um, has been you know so up and down. But you know that win against Glasgow last week, being back at home again this week, um, a monster team who they will surely sense, you know. Uh, uh, they they they'll, they'll see weakness in a monster team, and and for Rantry and, and and his coaching staff to to be able to pick them back up again. And as I said, like the beauty of it is, is that they know they've done this before. They, they trust this team's character, mm. um, but you still have to fix the nuts and bolts, you know. So it, it, I didn't think like, obviously the zebra match there was question marks around their intent and investment and uh, and, and work rate, whereas. I didn't think that was really the issue against the Stormers. It no, was no. effectively it was effectively just not being good enough at the basics. And um, if they can bring if they can improve that drastically this weekend, they still may, may not have enough, right? But at least it would be back on an upper curve again, like they were in the Ospreys game um, after after Zebras. And that's they can obviously win for sure. They can win, but if the Sharks play to their best, it's a big big ask for Munster, even with improvement to to beat them I think yeah it's going to be an interesting one so that's uh, 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon Leinster so they're playing the Lions this weekend they're 5 wins out of 5 so far 5 bonus point wins out of 5 33-12 over Connacht last Saturday evening at the Dexcom Stadium was that was that the the closest thing to an 80 minute performance Leinster put in this season yeah it was um, it was better than the week before it was better than the week before against Munster. Um, uh, and look, we shouldn't be surprised that the gap has got bigger. I mean, Leinster are stronger than they were last year mm-hmm. on the field, right? They're stronger. And they've obviously, Nina Barr's had a preseason. Himself and Tyler obviously have worked together. So there's the attack and defense has joined up. They've got, some, um, they've got this decent South African second row in this year. Yeah. You know, he's a, he's a, right. some, young, some young fella, some young fella. Um, like so, he yeah, so he he automatically makes them stronger. They're going to be stronger again with with, with Barrett. Um, their internationals are are playing very well. You know what I mean? Like like so James Ryan, um, Doris. Porter, etc. Doris has been exceptional. Um, and like they only had half a team. Like they only had half of their best team. But that those those seven or eight were all excellent. Like Hugh Keenan's work in the backfield, his scramble defense. Um, uh, was was phenomenal. Like that's the problem is Connacht actually did open up some opportunities, but like we saw against Munster, Leinster scramble is is, is so good. I'll tell you the the, exact, the the moment that I'm most not most impressed or shocked by, but I think that what I what I speak about Munster and and the reason I, I said this last week was Leinster were able to go after Munster in the defensive lineout because they're not afraid of their mall. Okay, they're not afraid of the Munster mall at the moment. And you can argue, oh, not many teams have a devastating mall. Go back to the, the Connacht game uh, against Leinster uh, at the weekend. Leinster playing into the wind in the second half. They caught a ball on the halfway line and mauled it to 22. And straight away, you're going, like, this team have the, the weapons to do lots of different things. And it was the, you know, it was just, if you're if I'm in that Connacht pack, having not been able to do any damage with my own mall, and I'm suddenly defending a mall that's going backwards, it's it's such a simple it's sorry it's a very hard thing to do but the effect it has on your mindset and um it's serious flex and and that's they have that they have everything like they they have everything that they would need you would say um to win a trophy 
people were counter arguing with they looked like they did everything the last couple of years as well. But I think this defense has gone to a new level, Neil. Um the physicality, the kick pressure. So like one of the reasons Connacht's exits were so bad was because of the pressure of the rook, the pressure um on the kicker's foot. Um even though the, the try James Ryan got got uh called back for yeah being in front of the kicker. Like it's a you know your job was I think it was Josh Ione, you like it just two bodies getting after him getting after kicking foot and even when Connacht Connacht would have thought he could kick on the edge I think because Munster got the ball to the edge quite easily the week before but when you look at when Connacht got the ball to the edge Bolton's not a natural kicker but there was always someone coming after him quite quickly so he wouldn't have had time to get that ball to his foot and down the field and then Cordero did try once and he kicked down the full. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's just like that's two. That's just one example. But it's a big, it's a big mistake. It's a big fault to make um, at a key moment of the game when you're playing into the wind. And Leinster punished them. Obviously, another bonus point win. Um, and they must be feeling really good about themselves. The Lions this week. Um, obviously, a team who probably uh, only other only other one hundred percent right. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, um, and. It, I presume Leinster would be, would be down to a second or third choice team. Um, I presume it'd be, yes, I presume a lot of those internationals won't play. So, but so it potentially is, is is the key game for them because they could go five points again and be in an unbelievably strong position and obviously knock off the other unbeaten team. Um, so yeah, their selection is going to be fascinating and seeing can they the, the Lions have the capacity to beat Leinster. I think to beat Leinster, you're either all-around team who have power like a La Rochelle, power and skill like a La Rochelle or a Toulouse or your kamikaze team like the Lions who can go from 60, 70 metres. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the thing. Like, if you think about the Munster and Collins were both able to get the ball to the edge and get around that rush. But the problem is they didn't have an absolute speedster or someone with unbelievable X factor to go and make that you know, really impactful on the game, whereas yeah. the Lions do have those. I think the Lions have scored more tries from their own half than they have from the opposition half. And um, <laughs> they have some no, no, but they have, they, they're like they're, they're they're crazy and they have speed. Um, so and like when it goes bad, it goes very it will go very bad for them. They're not the perfect team. They're not contenders, but they could damage hurt Leinster as well. If Leinster are weaker, like Leinster being able to manage, Leo's managed his selection for the first five weeks. Really well, you know. Um, you know, the first the first round we had, but um, the kind of partnerships were young and old or young and experienced. Um, but this this may be the most inexperienced team he's picked of the of the first block, and maybe the Lions have the capacity to hurt them, but uh, no one has really hurt them yet. Yeah, well, look, we saw back in was it April or May just yeah. how clearly the Lions could hurt Leinster when they tonked them over in Johannesburg. So that is. Uh, Saturday evening, five fifteen, live on RT two and RT player on on the Connacht part of this. Then, like, played reasonably well, and you know, just were well beaten by a very very good Leinster team. But the the big thing is, and Pete Wilkins and Joe Joyce, who we spoke to after the game, both like stressed this and underlined this. They've been getting a lot of nice compliments over the last few weeks for the way they've started the season, but. If they lose to the Dragons this Saturday and are two out of four through the opening six games, that's a pretty, I don't want to say an embarrassing record to be to be stuck with. But, you know, if you're getting a lot of these compliments for for playing really nice, attractive rugby, you can't come back after six weeks and be and be two out of six. No, no, you can't be. And they won't be. They won't be. The Dragons have have improved. They're more competitive. They're staying in games for longer. Um, but they've had they had four four home games uh, and they beat the Ospreys the first game. Um, they certainly had three home games anyway, uh, and they're not getting the the job done. Like I, I wouldn't read too much into a Welsh team beating a Welsh team. Um, mm. It's nearly a competition in itself. Uh, and uh, the Connacht, Connacht unless they capital, or capitulate massively, will win this week. The challenge for them, Neil, is. Their defense hasn't shown a huge improvement uh, from the last couple of years. Like they're shipping a lot of points. Um, and they must be on maybe thirty points a match, uh, and that's the challenge. For them. Dragons probably don't have the the creativity to to really exploit that, but they need to get that fixed. Um, and there's a big challenge 
for them because you can't go out and have to outscore have to score thirty five points, you know, week in week out to to win. It's, it's in, the, in the Premiership at the moment. In fairness, there's a few teams who are trying that technique, are trying that um, trying that philosophy. Um, but realistically, in the URC, um, for Connacht, they just need to be better defensively, um, and that that'll be their big focus. And if you get that right, they'll they'll win lots of games. Yeah, and look, like Joyce kind of alluded to the fact as well, obviously, after this weekend, they do have four weeks until their next competitive match. There'll be an A match in there or two just to keep them ticking over. But, you know, they have a nice little break here coming up after this weekend. So you can kind of put yourself into cup rugby mode for the week that's yeah. in it. And also from Pete Wilkins' point of view, hasn't really rotated the squad too much in these opening few games. There's a, a large chunk of that squad that are yet to play. Uh, but they have the opportunity where they get through these these few we- uh, these few weeks off. They have what one big URC game when they come back. Then they're into the Challenge Cup, and that's when they can start resting a couple of bodies, rotate the squad around again, and that gets you up to the to the Christmas Interpros. And you know if they can get in this weekend and get a decent win under the belts, they're in a good league position. You've kind of bought yourself time to to work your squad through until midway through the campaign. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. I think. I'd, I'd imagine Jack Carty will play this week. Um, uh, I actually think he should have played against Leinster. I, I think, I think that that that's. Uh, I think that I, I I prefer to see I own I only play against Dragons. I think, uh, I think they were all over, they overplayed uh, and uh, against against Leinster in that first half. And I, I know there was a big win, but um, if you spend as long as they did on, your, on their own twenty two, um, or in that area, you're you're going to you're going to get hurt, you know, um, and I think Jack could have helped Ben Murphy more than maybe I only was able to. I think he's still adjusting to Northern Hemisphere rugby and, and that and that pressure. Would you would you agree? Yeah, I like even on that part of it, as you said, playing too much rugby in their own half. I remember I was at the match and after 25, 26 minutes, I think it was, it, I think it was just around the point when Ioane, when they won that penalty and Ioane ended up missing touch. And I went back to just check the, the stats at that stage Connacht, uh, Connacht had more possession than Leinster through the opening 25, 26 minutes, but they had 5% territory. Yeah. It was, it was, it would have been 90, 95% of that first 25 minutes were played in Connacht's half, and Connacht had the majority of the possession. I, I can't remember seeing a stat like that before. No, I think the overall stats for, um, of possession was Connacht won a couple of three, but that's not the key to beat Leinster. It, yes. Yeah, you're better off without, without the ball, I think. Um. Uh. Yeah. It. It. I'm not. Look. It wasn't Josh Leone's fault. It was. It was a combination of, of just not being able to win collisions and not being able to create, you know, decent, uh, uh rook speed ball, and go 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 hurt Leinster. But like we saw. Do you remember Paul Boyle made a a really good carry in the first half and yeah and and and, and Connacht went to go to Wiss and they got caught ten yards behind the game line. You know so. The normal rules of, or the normal principles of, of attack and rugby have to be different against against this Leinster defence. That's how much of an outlier it is in this competition, and how how good it is compared to other teams. So, I think that's look. It's, it's early days. Coaches are still looking at it, watching it, seeing seeing where the where the the wrinkles or the or the opportunities are in it. But I, I do think, unless coaches adapt their normal principles uh, when they play Leinster. It'll be one way traffic uh, in terms of results. Um, but look, from Connacht's point of view, yeah, I, I, I think Dragons is a game where they can actually kind of play more, uh, like do what they try to do against Leinster, and, and get more benefit from it. They're not as well organised defensively, uh, but it'll, if it, if Jack does play, great opportunity for him to lay down a marker. But certainly, I only does give them a different profile um, as a as a ball runner and a ball player. Yeah. I thought it was a really, really enjoyable game for for one that was kind of ended up in one one sided on yeah. the scoreboard. Finish up on Ulster, 36-12 winners against the Ospreys away to Cardiff this weekend. Uh after four tough opening rounds where they ground out two very, very valuable wins and obviously had the, the tour of South Africa. I think a 36-12 win against the Ospreys at home where you score was it three or four tries in the opening 15, 20 minutes? That is that is, that was just what Richie Murphy and Ulster needed, I think, last weekend. A good blowout. Yeah, and no real stress. Now yeah. look at the, once the Ospreys um notified us that they were so short. They had a hooker. All, yeah. yeah, it was always gonna be um yeah. it was always more than likely gonna be an Ulster win. But like 
their home win against Glasgow was stressful. Their home win against Connacht was was you know pretty stressful, and and, and they had to dig it out. Whereas here they just were in you know smile on your face rugby, you know, and uh, feeding off. It looked really good actually. It looked, and I think that kind of easy win and the quality of of some of their execution will will stand to them. I think look, they're good enough to go to Cardiff and win. I mean, Cardiff have Cardiff have gone from being the team that we all thought would be the best Welsh region. Um, to really struggle a little bit, and uh, now they don't. They don't have Josh Adams or Falatau, um, uh, and maybe they're getting caught overplaying a little bit. Uh, but to lose at home to the Scarlets, they were pretty well battered by Edinburgh. Now they hung in there and 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 you know and, and showed a bit of character. But um, this is this could be this. Like I think if Richie Murphy is gonna is gonna target games and and you know Fortress to Raven Hill. Um and and pick four or five away games where you can go full metal jackets. This is certainly one um that they can do, particularly with this gap now afterwards when you can rest bodies up. So um I, I, I think Ulster have enough to to beat Cardiff away, which would be a great start for them. Obviously, three wins at home yeah. and one away. Uh, and I haven't got South Africa done and dusted, given the cutbacks and given new coaching staff and Jimmy Duffy only coming in, etc. Uh Richie would be chuffed with that. Yeah, I, I was kind of just about to, to liken it to Connacht's situation where mm. if you get in after this block uh, as an Ulster supporter, three wins out of three, you're you're feeling very, very good about that opening block of games. A um, couple of things that jumped out from that match as well. Um, on paper, not like the most daunting pack in the world, like missing mm. quite a few players from what would be their, their starting pack, but they still have that mall and they still know how to use it. Yeah, they do, but I, uh, the mall is 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 still strong, and that's brilliant because that is a real weapon for them, and that kind of got them through some tough times. Mm. But I actually just there's a physicality and a an aggression, um, and a doggedness about Ulster up front that had been lost a little bit. I I, I felt that they were kind of soft touches, um, a little bit under at the end under Dan, um, and that's not a question of Dan, but just that's just the way we just didn't yeah. look like they had an edge and confidence and things confidence, yeah yeah a new new voice and, and some new players I mean the, you know uh, some of those youngsters who are coming through um, their own academy have a have a have an athletic athleticism which is needed but also seem to have a bit of bite about them as well so yeah Jimmy yeah it looked, like when Jimmy Duffy took that job you would have looked at that pack and you would have went Ooh, there's not a huge amount in that we're losing pitch off we're losing Dave Ewers you know, um, but what they're actually putting together um, as a unit is um, is certainly on the right track. Yeah, and then the the last point on Ulster, and it brings us all the way back around to to the Ireland squad. Someone I was going to mention, Jacob Stockdale, who's in the Ireland squad, has been in Ireland squads for the last year. He was in South Africa, he was in the Six Nations squad, but didn't play. Um, has started this season, as you said, they're kind of the. The, the win on Friday night, it was they were able to play with a smile on their face. And he's kind of summed up that, I think, in the last couple of weeks, has had a, a very, very strong start of the season. Um, How do you think he fits in from an Irish point of view? Is is his only real chance of getting in there if James Lowe is to be unavailable? Just because we've, you know, I think he's only started maybe one or two games on the right wing for Ulster in his whole career. He's played mm. at full back a little bit, but hasn't really done that in the last couple of seasons. Is he an out now left wing in your mind? Yeah, he is an out now left wing. I wouldn't be. I'd be keen to have a look at him um, in one of the one of the start, big start tests. Start him left. Start him left wing in. in start one. left wing, maybe. And I'm not saying Fiji. I, I I would like to see him play against Argentina or Australia. Yeah. Um, just because I think his form deserves it. I think he's got. Yeah, it sounds. He's got more finishing ability than James, uh, as in out and out finisher. Low, low scores a huge amount of tries and and I'm not crit- questioning his ability there but I think Stockdale is a more dangerous finisher the challenge is even though he's evolved his game he's not he, he's he's very unlike what Farrell likes in his wingers yeah. you know it's not his natural game to like a, like, like the way a Hansen or Calvin yeah. Nack are coming in off wings and getting involved yeah, Farrell, in Farrell calls it untidy he likes untidy wingers um, and uh, the others the others are better at that. Um, obviously, Calvin's a is a right winger, but um, I, I still think Stockdale, given how Ireland play and how attack is is so good, you know, you get you get people putting him into space, he will he will do serious damage. Um, he's he's the type of player that I, I was mentioning 
like that you would want against Leinster, you know, where they can actually go hand off somebody and go 40, 50 meters. Um, and maybe have that kick kick ahead game, which he's also very good at as well. Um, uh, and has been a huge part of his game where he, he puts it on the, on the toe and, and wins the foot race. Um, so that's, yeah, I, I'd like to see him get a game, not Fiji, not just Fiji. Um, I think he's he's not far off J- uh, James Lowe, but hasn't done enough to pass him out yet. Yeah, going to be interesting to see. So Stockdale is part of that Ireland 35-man squad and Ulster away to Cardiff this evening, or this Saturday evening, 7.35 kickoff. At the same time, Connacht are at home to the Dragons. As we said, Sharks and Monsters, 3 o'clock. Leinster against the Lions is at 5.15. Bernard, thanks a million for that. Enjoy your chats with Andy Farrell this evening. Thank you. Let me all say hello. It's been a pleasure having you on. We'll be back for the RT Rugby podcast this time next week.